how you doing today, Rob? Uh, welcome to uh, another edition of uh, the Rally Founders Talk. Um, one of the things, Rob, I, I think you're very familiar with this, but I'm going to repeat it for you, um, is uh, that Rally is a social enterprise accelerator. Um, our goal is to help uh, passionate entrepreneurs um, transform their ideas and existing work into sustainable ventures that create positive social change. And one of the things that we believe, which is really cool, is that we believe Orlando can be an international hub for social entrepreneurship because we have all the, the right talent here, um, resources and, and connections and networks. And so therefore, anybody, no matter where they're at in the world, if they're you know, an early stage entrepreneur, they should take a, uh, um, a journey through Orlando, hopefully stay here, but, um, but definitely they should take a journey here and stop through here. And, and spend some time with us. So um, with that being said, man, we want to welcome you to this um, Founders Talk. Let me go ahead and reposition this a little bit here. All right, cool. Um, so we always like to start these things off with um, you telling us a little bit about um, baby Rob. You know, who, who was he? Um, and, and more importantly, uh, talk about Seriously, baby Rob? Yes. You want to... We want to know about baby Rob. <laughs> and we want to know how baby Rob ended up doing the work that he did. So if you can just kind of give us a little short history of from baby Rob all the way up to adult Rob and, and how things in your lives got you to where you're at today. Sure. I'm actually having fun watching, watching Shazia on guests this morning. <laughs> oh yeah, there we go. This is Kevin. We love Good really morning, Kevin. Kevin. Say hi. We were the same hi to you. <laughs> he whispered it. Yeah, I'll take it. Um, so thanks, Kyle. Um, so uh, again, I'm I'm Rob Panapinto, and uh, yes, I'm very familiar with what Kyle said because I'm very honored to to be one of the the co-founders of Rally along with the two gentlemen that are with us today and, and uh, some others who absolutely helped us get to, get to where we get to where we are. Um, and I'm currently the chair of uh, the chair of our board. Uh, and I also uh, run a, an organization called Entrepreneurs in Action, which actually was one of the uh, sort of antecedents of, of of what became Rally. It's one of the two entities that, that merged to become Rally, but now is spun off into becoming the managing partner of a social venture fund that invests in social, uh, social enterprises, uh, largely through the Rally program, although not fully wed to that. We've made four investments so far and three of them are, are through Rally. Um, Kyle, I don't, I don't remember what baby Rob, <laughs> I don't remember what baby <laughs> Rob was, was, was thinking. Um, but, but I will say, and, and I don't know that I've come to, I didn't come to really connect those dots until probably the last 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. But I, I grew up in a, in a family that was, uh, you know, my stepdad was a main street shopkeeper. He, uh, he ran two independent pharmacies. I grew up in New York City. He ran two independent pharmacies in, in a part of Brooklyn. Uh, that was, you know, it's kind of a rough, kind of a rough part of town and I got to work there through most of my teen years. And I, I, I guess without even discussing it, I, I started to understand the power of what a small business uh, is in a community and the role it can play. Um, in those days, pharmacies were very different. A lot of people didn't have health insurance, payment was an issue. Um, so again, from, from letting someone go to the next week before they, they pay their medicine for their medicine for their kids or to hiring the, the, the local kids in the community. You just, you just, I just began to see the impact that a business could have in, in a community. And then as I started to move my career, and I always, I've always worked in entrepreneurial companies, been part of entrepreneurial companies, I've launched some companies. Um, it's always been apparent to me the, the importance of, of businesses inside of, of a community. Um, and, and increasingly over time beyond just, beyond just the jobs or the philanthropy or community involvement, but but really the, the innovative ideas that business brings to the table towards solving community problems. So, so it's kind of a slow climb along that, that evolution. And I spent most of my time here in Orlando, my wife and I moved here in the early nineties. 
I spent most of it uh, being part of the founding team of, again, of a very small manufacturing company that was fortunate enough to grow and change entrepreneurial, entrepreneurially multiple times and time, you know, be another fun, fun story. But, but we went from being an audio cassette manufacturer, uh, making books on tape in the mid nineties to being the, one of the leading providers of technology and call center solutions for health insurance companies trying to figure out how to sell insurance individually to consumers. Uh, it all made perfect sense to us across a 20 year journey. It, it's a little strange when you tell it, it's just at just the bookends. Um, but when we sold uh, and, and when we sold the company in 2011, I left about two years afterwards. And by that time, I'd been very involved in, in the community and really began to see Orlando as a place with so much opportunity and so much potential, but also some real pressing social social challenges. We were, we're a community that largely because of the makeup of our, of our economy uh, always has issues uh, around homelessness, housing. Uh, food insecurity, um, the diversity of our the, you know, the diversity of our population creates this interesting melting pot of problems and and, and challenges. And so, so after I exited exited the company, having seen the power of what entrepreneurism and scaling companies can do in a community, rather than start another company, I wanted to get back involved into the community. And so, I got very involved in trying to create other uh, other scalable entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship, and I've done that through a variety of 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 things um, through being on nonprofit boards by investing directly in those companies. I currently serve in a role at, at uh, the UCF incubator where I help I help run our run our incubator system, focusing on strategies and and partnerships. And so, got very involved in entre entrepreneurship. Um, at the same time, uh, one of our other founding partners is the what was the Community Foundation of Central Florida, now the the Central Florida Foundation. And the foundation has had always been on the cusp of being convening and then and putting forward solutions around solving some of our social some of our social issues, and 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 that sort of led me down the road of of social enterprise, which to me sort of taking this philosophy of of that business can be a source for good on the community, and taking it to another level because now you're actually taking the business itself, the foundation of what the business does, and applying applying it towards those social social issues. So it's it's not, hey, I'm a good corporate citizen. I'm going to get involved in my community. I'm going to give to philanthropies. I'm going to serve on boards. No, the actual technology service product core of the business of itself is solving is solving a community issue. And I, I became increasingly attractive to that, which is why we started Entrepreneurs in Action at, at the Central Florida Foundation, how I met Ben, Kyle, how I met you. And and how we started, how we started with rallies. So, right, right. yeah. Um, I'm interested in what. Wait, oh yeah, that's not easy. I have to uh, like I'm resonating here. Okay. Um, I'm interested in in what was the what was the thing that happened or things that happened that caused you to um, become interested in re-engaging the community. I mean, it wasn't just a story of seeing just the, your father running a pharmacy in Brooklyn and yeah. seeing the impact of that. But then what were some of the other things that were motivating you to, um, that you like that, that fuel that, that desire or that thought? Did you see some things occur? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, you know, um, I, I do believe that in some cases, Kyle, these things are, they're, they're both conscious and unconscious. There are, there are things you decide to do and there are things that I think you are called to do that sometimes you might not even know at that exact moment that you were being called to do them. And it's only with looking back a little bit that you start to connect, connect some of those dots, at least for me. I wish I could be that conscious uh yeah you know, all, all the time right I, I and and i work on trying to be more purposeful as time goes on but i, I said I, here i mean I, I again essentially i, I guess here, here's what what happened um as our company started to scale i got more involved in the community and i saw what i could what what the impact i could have in very small ways and so after we sold the company and and you know i was blessed to be in a in a in a good position um, 
I could have gone down two paths and both paths are, are valid paths. I, I could have gone back and tried to do what we did in our company connections and do it again. Like, let's go start another company. Let's go, let's go replicate this. And, and several of my partners did and have been very successful in, in doing that. I conscious, that was a very conscious decision. I did not want to do that. Um, two reasons. One was very personal. I had spent a lot of times on airplanes. My daughters at that time were 11 and nine and didn't want to be gone three days a week. And so part of it was, you know what? I just want to spend more time with my, my family. You start, when they get to that age, you start to see that, you know, you, the window's starting to close and when they're going to, you know, fly the coop. And so let's take those years. You don't get them back. And so there was that. Um, but I also did feel a real responsibility, frankly, if I, you know, if you looked at how other communities have been built around innovation and entrepreneurship and, and scale, it has, it has been because those who have been blessed enough to be successful dive back in. And, and I wanted to dive, I wanted to dive back in. So so some of it was a little bit of, a, of, of just how I wanted my life to be, but some of it really was a, a, a calling around, okay, you, you, you're in a position now where you can help in a different way you could before, go help. And, and Orlando is definitely to me, which is why, by the way, I think we're so right for the things that we're doing collectively here. Orlando, because we're so young, you know, you don't have to be someone's grandson to be on a board or to raise your hand to get involved. It is still very much a community where you're one degree of separation to just about anyone in the community. And if you raise your hand and say, I want to get involved and you're passionate and competent about it, people will say, come on board, help us, help us out. So that, that's really what it was, Kyle. It was really a decision after having the opportunity to decide what I want to do next after the sale of the company to be intentful in how I wanted to spend my time. Rob, I like that. In your story there, we went from like independent pharmacies in Brooklyn, which I bet there are very few of those left. Well, this was the 80s, but yes, yeah, you're probably right. To, to cassette tape audiobooks, to health call centers, to impact investing and community engagement and entrepreneurial incubators like um that is like a, a you've traveled a long distance but hanging out with you i'm i've learned that it's because there's like this transferable set of business knowledge that you have that can be applied to community problems or to very small brick and mortar businesses or to it solutions for large problems like I'm wondering where that business sense came. Like if you were gonna say, did you learn that most on the ground in high school? Were you a business major in college? Where, where was the most formative time for you in your business thinking that has been able to pivot and serve you in so many different settings, you know? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I think you're always learning. So, so there's, there's that, right? So it's, I think that the, being open to the mentor of mine said, you know, one of the keys is, not, you know, knowing what you don't know. And, and I think that's right. So I, 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 you know, I try to be intellectually curious about things I, I approach, um, which you have to sort of remind yourself to do sometimes. Um, be open to that. Uh, I, I think it just happened. I think it happens over time, Ben. I, I definitely believe, and there's a danger in this because you can be careful. You have to be careful because institutional knowledge and, and vertical expertise is really important, right? There are things, some of, the, some of the stuff you guys are doing in particular requires very specific vertical knowledge, understanding, particularly when you start getting things that are, are of a regulatory nature. And so this thought that you could sort of come from the outside and figure something else out that the people that are invested in it for long periods of time don't know is a very dangerous, almost arrogant thing. So you need to be careful with that. That being said, I, I, I do believe that, that fresh perspectives and fresh thinking on things that have been intractable problems, whether they be in business or in community over long periods of time, 
you know, that opening up the window and, and, and rethinking things is, is, is critical to innovation. Innovation absolutely comes through diverse thoughts and thinking. So, so I think that's how I've been able to make those jumps because just about everything I've been involved in is, is somewhat different than the things I've been involved in. But to your point, there, there are some very core fundamental tenets around how you run a business, how you think about things differently, how you try to innovate that I think you can take. You just gotta be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater of the people that have spent you know, 20, 30 years fully invested in their business. I don't think there's any one moment on that, Ben. I think it's I, I think it's a journey. And a lot of it, frankly, has been has been mentorship. I have been so blessed to over what now a 30 some odd year business career and, and community career all along the lines to have had people who have taken an interest in me still do <clears throat> and and sort of coach me you know, coach and mentor me along. And I, I take, I, you know, I take from them. I, you know, one point of reference for a bunch of folks you guys know. I mean, what I've learned, for example, from Mark Brewer over the last dozen years now of being part of the foundation around some of the issues in, in community building and how you build community mm -hmm. um, combined with some of my thought, I, 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 you know, that's been so wonderfully um, powerful, powerful for me. So, I don't think there's any one moment. And no, I don't, I don't have an MBA. I have a master's, but it's not an MBA. Uh, my master's is in, is actually in public, public communications. I was going to take a very different path uh, in mm -hmm. graduate school than the one, the one I talk. So, you know, if I have an MBA, it's, it's been an on the ground MBA working in the companies that I've been part of. Yeah. I, um, you know, I've thought about that. Like, how, how do I get to where I am today and all the things that I've done that led me to this point? And, um, and I have a degree in biology and, and I always think, like, well, how was that useful for, for this? And I think that ultimately yeah. what the conclusion I've come to is that it was never biology that I was interested in. What I, was, what I realized is that throughout my, my life, I had a natural curiosity for how things worked and, and how they um, and so I would take things apart. I would put them back together from a very early age. Um, and so that just kind of, I think, led me into biology because it's like, how do a system, biological systems run, which then explains why I was interested in, in business. And I would have the privilege of being in an internship where it exposed me to all the, the different areas of business. And I got to see not just in a silo what, the, what those areas did, but how they connected to each other and how they allowed the business to operate and then when I think about now, like the things that I'm interested in is building stuff and, and figuring out how it should work and trying to get it to work, right? And so with that being said, I think it's, it's ultimately like this natural curiosity um, and um, ability to focus and discipline and become disciplined around a certain set of things, which is just a transferable skill that I've developed, right? The, the ability to see things, take it apart, to critically think it, to problem solve it, which applies to all the things I'm doing even today with these with these fellows, right? And so, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I think that makes sense. And I, I think for me, I, I always have this feeling of, there's, you know, there's just gotta be a better way to do this. There's gotta be, there's gotta be a different, there's gotta be a different way to do this. And there's no doubt that at some point psychically that, you know, that obviously motivates and, and, mm -hmm. and energize me to be involved in those, in those settings. Um, yeah. I like what you were saying too, Rob, about the balance of subject matter expertise and business savvy, because I feel like we've seen that in rally where sometimes the people that have the, the, deepest knowledge on a on a product or problem I have get bogged down in being able to identify with the customer because they're so far down the problem they can't imagine a time when the customer couldn't see the problem with the depth of clarity that they could and so it's interesting to think about that especially in social enterprise where the problems matter so much um, to, to get that right balance of industry expertise and problem sophistication, but also a business case that just makes sense and appeals to a customer. Yeah, it's, it, again, it's a, it is a really delicate balance. And, 
And, you know, I, you, you got to catch yourself. I mean, I find myself in, in certain areas now where I have presumably some expertise where you you'll automatically start with this sort of defensive sort of, well, you yeah. can't be done that. It can't be done that way. Cause if it could be done that way, why would I have already been doing it? Right. Um, and, and you gotta, you, you gotta really get, get, get past that. Um, but again, on the flip side, you can't just swoop in and say, well, I know nothing about this, but here's how you should do it and not respect, you know, people's, people's expert expertise. So it is a fine balance. I, I, I've always believed that one plus, in those things, one plus one should equal three, right? So the magic is, and from a leadership perspective, um, you know, as a CEO or, or a community leader, that to me is the magic. How do you, how do you sort of, you get the, the, the detailed expertise and insights you need from a whole host of people, but also that real push and challenge around doing things, doing things. And I, and I do think that's what's always so exciting about Rally because we are approached by these wonderful entrepreneurs who um, some, in some cases do come from the industry and have said, no, we've got to figure out a better way to, to do this. Or in some cases, just, you know, they're so called by the social mission no, it's not working the way it needs to work and, and hasn't, maybe hasn't quite figured out how the business needs to migrate to get there, but they're so passionate about getting there. So how do you then surround them by some of the other expertise they need to actually move, move, it, move it forward? But it is, it, is a real, it is a real unique unique balance. Man. And particularly now in this world too, where you have technology changing things in so many different, you know, so many different ways. I think we're you know, I, I know Jason's business fairly well because he's also in the UCF incubator as well. I mean, where we're that type of, of, of financing, whether it's equity or debt and, and the use of online platforms, or, I mean, that, that is dramatically changing by the minute. So, you know, some of the old, some of the old stuff that, yeah, it's probably time to throw some of the baby out with the bathwater, but it's also highly regulated, so you can't just throw all the baby out with a bad order because the regulation doesn't tend to keep up with the innovation. So, it's an interesting challenge. Yeah. Um, um, uh oh, uh -oh. I'm getting this feedback. Did, didn't you hear that? Yeah. Okay. There we go. It's gone. Um. So I want to be, before we we get to like Rob's golden nuggets of of practical wisdom and immediately applicable wisdom, uh, applicable wisdom. Um, I wanna know about, as we talk about motivations and subject matter expertise, like you're, you're very involved right now in, in, in affordable housing. What was the thing, what drew you to that? And, and did you have the background to, in that? And if not, then how did you go about surrounding yourself with the right people or the right information to make yourself credible because right now you, you you're you're one of the, the leading thought leaders on this within yeah. our region <laughs> yeah well you know the answer to the second part of that question the answer is no uh so it is kind of interesting well uh because i'm not a real estate I, i'm not a real estate guy in any or developer in any way shape or form it um i, I listen it came from it came from this conversation where we're having um um, so maybe a couple of you guys know this, um, local guys. Um, so, so a couple of years ago, I decided to, to sort of <laughs> migrate to the dark side a little bit and ran for public office. And part of it was uh, because I, I got frustrated. Uh, outsiders who run for public office, it tends to come from some sort of frustration. Um, I got frustrated that there were some things in our community that I just didn't see us having the conversations we needed to, and they tended to be the things that were longer term, which sometimes when you're in public life, it's harder to think in those longer terms because you have shorter election cycles and all that, you know, all that practicality. And affordable housing was one of them for me, because for those of you who are familiar with affordable housing issues in Florida, um, particularly in Orlando, we have a double-edged problem here because we have both a supply problem and a demand problem. Uh, we live in a community that people want to live in for very, very obvious reasons. And so they continue to come here, um, which creates demand issues. 
On the other hand, um, we have an issue of being either the lowest or the second lowest economy in terms of wage. So we have a lot of people here who have a hard time making a good income. We have a lot of people coming in. We have not enough supply being built. And so all of that leads, you know, Nathan, Nathan, you get this. I mean, that all leads to a huge, huge crisis. And it's been going on for years. It's been going on for years for me. And it, 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 listen, it's a national problem, but it's really acute. And for a long time, I found that the solution, the conversation was, not to get too much in the details, but there's this state affordable housing fund that for about, I don't know, about 20 years has not been fully funded. And so a lot of the effort here had been around, let's go up to Tallahassee, tell Tallahassee they need to fund this fund. Let's be shocked and surprised when they don't and say, oh, we tried. And the Orlando Sentinel would run their editorial and, and people would say, oh, we need to do this. And there's only so many times you could see that movie before you go, guys, yes, they should, they should fund the fund, but can we try something else? And so I got passionate about it, Kyle, because it was a problem that needed to be solved. It's a, still a problem that needs to be solved. I didn't think we were addressing it effectively. And so I felt we needed to do something very much more locally focused, which is how I got involved and why I'm still involved in it, even though obviously I didn't, you know, I didn't win that, that, that race, but certainly I can still have an impact in, in the local community. How I got my knowledge was in the process of, because again, you got to sort of, you got to move past that aha moment of, okay, this is a problem we, it, it, I would be as guilty as, as, as what I'm sort of blaming the other side a little bit here for if all I said was, well, we got to do something different and then didn't come up with, okay, what's the different, right? So I then drilled my, what it's something another mentor of mine would be, would call becoming a student of the sport. So I dove into it, right? I mean, I spoke to a lot of people, um, a lot of good work with the Central Florida Foundation and Mark, but talked to a lot of other people and, okay, what if we did this? We looked at what we started to look at what other communities were doing, and and that's ultimately how we how we came up with the solution to launch uh, to launch this fund, which again initially was going to be more of a public private partnership, and now will be more of a private partnership. So, so as I said, I think it comes from all the stuff we're talking about. This sort of you know passion and desire and recognition that something needs to be changed from the outside, but then bringing in the insiders to help design the design the solution. Yeah, I think like I I love that story because I feel like one thing I've learned about entrepreneurs is it takes a mix of like confidence and optimism. Like here's a problem that there is large government energy energy around addressing that ought to be done, and then here's Rob, and Rob's like, you guys are not doing a good enough job. I'm gonna fix it. This problem should be fixed. I'm going to fix it. I want to become a student of the sport and I'm going to move forward. And he, you're not like arrogant enough to say, I'm going to do it on my own. But there is a confidence that's like, people have been thinking about this, but not thinking right. And I can think about it better, more deeply. I can involve the right people. I can motivate the right parties. And there just takes a degree of optimism and confidence that I think it's like almost an inborn thing. Entrepreneurs, you either have that or you don't. And um, so I'm not saying that you can't learn to be an entrepreneur, but there is a certain personality for whom it's much easier to be an entrepreneur than others. Yeah, you, say? I, you know, I think that's I, I think that that's right. Listen, we'll see whether we 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 pull this off or not. Uh, it's you know, it's a hard road and we're silly not there yet, um, but we're working at it. I, I, I think that um, I, I think that's right. I think I, I am a naturally optimistic person. Uh, who absolutely believes uh, that that uh, if if you dedicate yourself to something and you do things a certain way that that good things will good things will happen. It doesn't always work out that way, but I do believe you have to start from that belief. And and on the flip side, I will tell you if you really want to get my back up to some extent, tell me I can't do something. <laughs> right? I mean that's sort of the immediate right. That's the immediate what? Like yeah. don't don't tell me that. Yeah. Because that'll get me even more motivated to try to to try to do it. What you what you hopefully learn over time is again that not to be arrogant about that and think that you 
have all, all, all of the answers, right? Take that drive, take that passion, take that optimism, but then make sure you start to know what you need, what you need to know to really be effective, to grow and, and to scale. So like, again, like we've been talking, I think it's really an interesting balance here, but I, I yes, I believe if, from an entrepreneurship standpoint, it absolutely starts with a, a passionate commitment and an optimism around whatever it is you're trying to, to accomplish inside of your business or your mission. Yeah. You, you cannot get Jeff Bezos to become a rally maker. How about that? <laughs> that may be true, Kyle. He's a little busy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you got time now, I think. Um, Jeff. <laughs> we didn't need his money. Um, anyway, uh, so I, I want to, so we, we, we've talked about baby Rob sitting outside of his, his, his father's pharmacy store, um, observing how his father's business is impacting the community um, while eating a pizza or a bowl of strawberries or whatever you were doing eating at that time. Um, and then we moved into your business and the evolutions that that made and, and then running for political office and then becoming like this affordable housing czar. I don't know if that's the word that has been assigned to you, but I'll give it to you today. I'll claim it. Um, and so there's a lot of things that have happened, right? Um, and, and so um, as we look at these these fellows and, and who are on you know this entrepreneurial journey, um, as well as um, uh, those who you know will listen to this later on, um, let, let's 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 talk about some of the the wisdom or insights that you can give people that they can walk away from today. Uh, and so you know we could do two or three, but, but I want to unpack each one. Um, what's the, what's the first thing that you feel like is like, that you feel like is most important that you want to say, not only to this audience, but one that's watching about social entrepreneurship and the journey and how to be successful at it? Well, I, I will, first I will say the the key to me, to the, to the real successful social enterprises I've, I've seen. Uh, and by the way, I, I have not, you don't necessarily need to, to be here at the very beginning because I have seen examples of where it happens over time, including a little bit with the gentleman uh, who in my box is up in the, the top left here, Ben. They're, the successful social enterprises intuitively balance both their mission and the business. And so the, you really start to understand how the two feed each other, how, how your business model actually thrives off of that balance so that your, how you build your revenue, how you manage your staff, how your margins operate, all very seamlessly blend, blend be, be, between those two. I'll give you a very specific example. Are, are, is Sean going to come do one of these, Cybler? Clean the world? No, yes. he's not. Yeah. He hasn't okay. signed up. So one of the other partners involved in this business is a, a wonderful social entrepreneur, Sean Seipel, who runs Clean the World here locally, which, which just has an amazing model, both a for-profit and a not-for-profit. And I got a chance to, to be an advisor for Sean for several years and, and still part of his advisory group. There was a point in his business where if you talk to the operators in the business about how they ran the business, they led with the mission, which on the one hand you'd argue is, oh, that's wonderful, right? They're leading with the mission. But it actually led to some interesting behavior where they were letting paying clients not follow certain processes in a way that was significantly eroding margin. And when you challenge the operators around it, they would say, well, you know, this gets us more in their case, getting more soap and it'll, you know, it allows us to have more soap for the mission. And until you were really able to explain to them how by eroding about a third of your margin meant that in the long term, you were actually going to have a far more detrimental impact on your mission, they wouldn't make that change. Now, I think that group understands understands that. And, and Sean, certainly as a CEO, 
you know, it's almost, you know, he could probably walk around his one of his his plants and almost feel almost feel that this way. It's become so so intuitive. But to me, that's that's an added burden of being a social entrepreneur is how do you mesh those two? And I do think you have to understand if you're fully committed to this social enterprise model that the two are are inexorably tied together. And so the business model, the culture of the company, the people you hire, how you communicate has to understand that that those things, the the business purpose, the, the success of the business and the success of the mission and the impact are inexorably tied together and are synergetic, synergistic. They're not, one does not, one does not push the other if you've really got it right. To me, that's the nirvana or the magic of, of those businesses. And I think the goal to try to, to get to. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I think one of the things that, that, that helps people clarify that or get to that balance, or I would say one of the things that at the beginning inhibits that balance is not being able to articulate explicitly what the problem is that you're trying to solve and how it connects to your customer. You have to, you're kind of finding your way intuitively through a problem that you believe to be there. But if you don't do the hard work of getting that purpose really clear and then building metrics around how do I know when I'm accomplishing that purpose and then tying that to, you just have to do the work to make it explicit. And some people are able to run into a business intuitively and hack it together. But you're, you, I believe you're right 100% that if you don't get really explicit and careful about that, the, the enterprise will crash and burn because one of the things will tip it over. You'll do yeah. one more than the other and they'll, it'll fall over one side or the other. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and metrics to me is the second one. And you, you know, you've heard me talk about metrics before, I, I, particularly in early stage companies. I would challenge each of you to really come up with both on the business and the social side, what are the, the two or three metrics that really drive the success of your business? Because you are, when you're building a company from where you folks are, it is easy to get lost in about 40 different things. Because in many cases, you're, you know, you folks are chief cook and bottle washers in your business. There's no huge staffs behind you. But what are the two or three key things that absolutely will dictate your success? It could be revenue. It, it, it could be a certain margin percentage. Um, it could be making sure you have a certain amount of customers within a certain period of time. Um, uh, it could be one of the social impact metrics. But I would know what those, I would know what those are. And, and you know, on the business side of it, early stage companies suffer from a lack of financial sophistication. And I'm not saying you need to go out and get a CPA, but man, you need to, you need to understand how an income statement and a balance sheet works. You cannot measure your business on how much cash you have in the month, in the bank at the end of the month. That is not a good metric for your, for your business. So you really do need to understand the main drivers and motivators of your business because so from an investor standpoint, I will tell you what we look at for companies at an early stage is, can you articulate the vision of where you're trying to get and have it be a big vision, right? Because investors want returns. But we're also looking at knowing if you've got to go from A to Z, do you understand enough how to get from A to B? Because if you never get, it's, it's fine if you know how to get to Z, but if you don't know enough about your business to how to get to B, you're not going to get there. And, and, you know, when you're at an early stage and, for example, raising capital, there's almost an understanding you're going to have to probably raise some capital later. So we're just trying to get you from A to B. So really understanding your business in a way that helps you move from A to B is really important. And again, you don't need to have, know how to get to A to Z, which is why you see these presentation slides with these hockey sticks and investors go, yeah, okay. Um, but, but I would encourage you to really spend the time here to understand what are those two to three things that you have to do uh, to really make your business, ex business successful. And so in Nate's case, you know, I think we're still, I'm one of his mentors, so I think we're still working through that. But is it, is it, you know, sign, you know, is it getting the, 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 
the revenue model on the property management side, the really key here? Is it having some of the back end plugins to help build the, the credit? Okay. I'm not sure I know the answer to those things yet. There may be other things I'm thinking of. For Jason, I know you've got the challenge of having, and you mentioned at the beginning, you've got to build two marketplaces at the same, you know, at the same time. Um, Marco, you've got to do the same thing, right? You've got to, you've got to educate consumers to use the product, but you've also got to get grocery stores with the product. So, so that can get daunting, and I would encourage you to really narrow that down to a couple, uh, just a handful of those key things, and then measure the hell out of them. Yeah. Um... So one of the things that the tools that we use, I feel that you already know this, Rob, is, is and, and for anyone who's listening to this um, and the fellows know about this, is the brain to get clarity on those things um, is the social lean canvas, which breaks the business out into 12 blocks. Um, the two most important blocks um, are, at, are at the top are the purpose and the impact. And so where the normal business canvas starts off with the customer, um, the social one starts off at, um, with, the, with the purpose and impact and then ensures that you're starting there and then building the business around a, a business, a viable business around that. And then ultimately you get to a point where you are looking at key, key metrics. What are those key metrics? The revenue structures, the cost structures and things of that nature. Um, and then the other thing that people can look look for is the um, theory of change, which we use, which shows um, a, a desired state of where the world and how the world should look. Um, and then what's the current state of the issue? So if it's housing, what does it currently look like? And if you do everything you need to do, what is it ultimately, what's the desired state of that? And then the business model fits up in the middle of it. So I just wanted to bring notice or bring those two documents to the, to the yeah. front so that if people are looking to um, try to address the things that Rob is talking about, that they can go out and, and Google those and get those documents. And then obviously you can apply to rally and, and we help our fellows walk through those documents. Yeah, but, 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 you know, Kyle, here's the key to that though, right? Those need to be living documents, right? They can't just be the thing you did and then it goes on a shelf or maybe you look at it every year. What I'm, what I'm really encouraging both, you know, certainly our, our cohort is in front of us, but, but, you know, anyone who's looking at this or anyone I, I, I talk to, understand what those are and then operate your, your business and where you prioritize your time as the CEO, leader of the company around those things. And, and here's the other challenge. They're going to change. Yeah. And because, of, because of the stages that you're at in companies, those may be the metrics for six to nine months. So you've also got to be continuing going back to them and saying, okay, I've reached this stage. Are these still the things I need to be paying attention to? Maybe they are, maybe they're, they're not. Right. This is the challenge of, of, of growing something from, from its very start beyond, but those are great tools and great documents, but they're only as good if you continue to, to refresh them and focus on them. Rob, like, uh, that was a, learning for me partly around how how badly did i want this business to work like i started in coffee very missionally i tell people i started coffee in coffee philosophically like i just wanted to be able to buy coffee directly from coffee growers and drink coffee that i knew was having a positive impact and not participating in an exploitative system right that was why i got into it and I just happened into Orlando at the right time where other people were ready for it. And so I was just kind of moving through it intuitively. But there was a point where I realized, I mean, this is like taking up now five, 10 years of my life. And it's got to be something more than something that just makes it, it if I'm going to continue to be a part of it. When I started to think about taking it seriously, I started to tune into some like business stuff. I found this um, Corner Office podcast called The Corner Office. And I remember listening to the dude that was at the time running Home Depot. And, and he said the first thing he did every morning, the dude that ran all of Home Depot, every time he gets up in the morning, first thing he does, he looks at sales numbers at a few uh, randomly selected stores that he knows will be indicators of sales. Sales numbers of specific individual stores that help him take the temperature of how the whole company is doing and compares it to the previous year. 
I, I thought that is so minute for the CEO of Home Depot to be the first thing that he looks at. But right. it's because if he doesn't, he cares so much about it. And he knows if that's not right, it's going to cascade up. And I realized I had to decide how serious, how badly I wanted my enterprise to work. And if it did, I had to develop the capacity to care about the right little metrics. Um, and I think it's like, a, it can be a gut check when you talk about having the right metrics, building a dashboard, watching them, evaluating them. It can be a gut check of how much are social entrepreneurs playing in a passion area with a problem that they care about and how much do they really want to build a business that works. And we've had to have that conversation with fellows before. Like you can just keep doing it if you want, if you're willing to pay for it out of your pocket. But if you want to build a business that works, you at some point have to care about these types of metrics. Yeah, which, which, by the way, is not a big, small thing, right? It's not an issue because you, know, you could be, oh. right? You, could, you yeah. could really be, your business may just be solving a very specific problem in, in a neighborhood, right? right? But again, you're going to need to do very specific things to make that happen. Yeah. Or you could be trying to scale something globally like Home Depot did. But again, there are some very specific things that you want to make sure that you're you're aware of and paying attention to. Um, yeah, the, and I do think that that's the key. No matter the size of the, no, of the yeah, it uh, doesn't matter. The right. Right metrics, yeah. Or the yeah. mission. No, that's that's yeah. exactly that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's good stuff. I, it it leads us right up into the Q and A session. Um, we want to open it up to to the to the fellows. Uh, if, if any of you have some questions um, that you would like to ask Rob, um, this is the time to do it. Wave your hand and then I'll go ahead and call you out. All right, cool. Shay, you're on the deck. Hey, Rob, how are you? Good. How you doing? Um, I'm doing great. How are you? Um, I have a question and I'm going to target it at your, your project with affordable housing. So I feel like there's a relationship with affordable housing to several of us here in the group, right? With some of the things that we're doing. Um, and from your perspective, what, who or what are some of the biggest detractors or saboteurs of that project? And who are some of the biggest supporters that you found? Well, saboteurs is, is sort of, a bad for me a, a, a word I wouldn't use because it, it indicates that someone is intentionally trying to 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 do something right so I I don't I I don't think that that's I don't think that that's the case I think that I think the the problem in affordable housing just just broadly is again you've got a supply demand issue um, and we're not just in building in general we're not necessarily keeping up in supply. I think that the concept of affordable housing has a negative connotation. So you run into, as you get into local communities, the, the, you know, the nimbyism of no one wants an affordable housing project in their neighborhood because you know what that means. And that's a real issue. That's a real issue at the local, uh, at the local level. Um, I guess that, that was one thought I had about a saboteur, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a real that's a real challenge, and so I think there needs to be better education. I mean, for example, in our fund, we have a very wide, wide definition of affordable of affordable housing here uh, because we have an issue that stems from obviously folks that are that are very precariously homed and very low income and, and potentially even borderline homeless. But in Orlando, I mean, you could be a family of four earning $50,000 a year, which is slightly over the median in, in, in Orange County and be you know, highly stressed uh, or, or burdened in terms of your rental or your home purchase. The prices, that, that, that's the way the price scale works down here. So you know, you're talking about teachers, firefighters, uh, certainly anyone young coming out, of, coming out of school or college. So, it's a, so I think there's an education issue around how broad, how broad the problem is. And I, I will say, affordable housing on the public side of it, the tax credit system is this sort of labyrinth of regulations that only a few people can sort of figure out how to get involved in it. And that doesn't necessarily open up the marketplace, which is part of the, part of the supply issue. So there's, 
there's lots of there's lots of little things that add up to a big problem, which is why we're trying. In our case, and, and by the way, they're doing this in Charlotte, they're doing this in many other communities as well. They're trying to bring more private capital to the solution as well, to broaden the number of developers and builders who will come to the table to build to build projects who may not have built affordable before, and, and maybe they're building more workforce housing. So, so I think it's it, at, at its core, I think that I, I think the challenge is just broadening the circle so that you can increase supply. And then educating people on why this is a good thing for all of us. Um, you know, when I was running for, for office, you'd walk into a fairly affluent neighborhood and you'd say, you know, and, and sort of affordable housing wouldn't be on their, their radar screen. And so you asked them where their kid was living and they were still living in the house. And then they'd go, oh, I kind of get it. My kid after college still lives with me because they can't afford an apartment. So you sort of got to meet people and where they see where they see the, the the problem, which is which is a, a little bit of a challenge. So I, I hope that helps. That's, that's really interesting. Um, you know, the fact when you said the end part, um, you, you know, you're right. Like you talk about affordable housing, the first thing they think of is, you know, like you know, those people are moving into our neighborhood, and you know, our our, our home value is going to decrease. And, yeah. And all or it's going to bring, or it's going to bring traffic, right? I mean, the whole host, right. right, a whole host of things, yeah. Sure. Right, a whole host of things, and then when you said that when you walk into an affluent neighborhood and you and you <laughs> and, and you say, well, your kids are living here because they can't afford a, a you know a decent place, and they're like, oh, like like, and so like changing the image. Um, of the of who that person is in their mind um, changes the conversation and and obviously helps it to become more successful, right? And and so words and um, words do matter, and like you said, meeting people where they're where they're at, well, especially especially now, right? Yeah, yeah, that's really especially cool. Um, do we have? Jason, I think Jason had his hand up. Jason, you had your hand up. All right, let's go ahead. Yeah, uh, can you can Billy you hear me? Crystal. Okay. Absolutely. So when do you know when uh, something is a philanthropic like 501c3 type problem or it's an impact sustainable business solution? When, when do you know when philanthropy is the tool versus social impact is the tool for a problem? Um, that's something I kind of struggle with and I'm curious to get your perspective on. It's hmm. a great question, Jace. Um Well, listen, I think there are certain, there are fundamentally, I guess the simplest way to look at it is, is there a way to, to generate the capital you need to solve your mission through anything else but philanthropy? There are some, there are some organizations, particularly around some, you know, I'd say some social services, nonprofits, um, where there, you know, there just may not be another way. They are wholly reliant on, on philanthropy. Um, but by the way, I, I don't think that it's necessarily in all cases also an either an either or. I mean, there are models here that are a blend of both, right? Most arts organizations are a blend of both. They rely on philanthropy perhaps to do, you know, big ticket things, renovations, building a new theater, but they run their operating budget on on ticket on ticket sales. Um, zoos would be another, you know, another example, aquariums that aren't municipally municipally owned. So there are, you know, there are but the Girl Scouts, right? They make a lot of money selling cookies, but they also raise raise philanthropy. So so I don't think it's an either, it's an either or even the company I mentioned before, Clean the World, their core model is a is a revenue generating model model where in their cases hotels pay them to pick up their soap. But they also have a nonprofit arm which allows them to take philanthropy to run educational and distribution programs in the third the third world. So I don't think it's an either I don't think it's neither or Jason. I think it's again, I think it goes back to where we were talking before about a real understanding of the business model and the pieces that you need in place to make the business sustainable while also driving driving the impact. Yeah, yeah. I, I, Rob, I, I, have to, I tell people to look at where the market is. So is there a market for donors who, who are motivated to address the problem that you want to solve? 
is there a market of customers who are willing to buy a product that addresses the problem you want to solve? And then the second level is, huh, which work do you want to do? Do you want to do the work of developing donors or the work of selling products? And so I feel like those are like, to your point, both can exist inside a company. But if, if you're a social entrepreneur who's looking at a particular problem and your question is, should I start a nonprofit or a for-profit? The first question is, is there a market of donors that care about this problem? Is there a market of customers that will buy a product that addresses this problem? If the answer is yes to both of those, then it's which work do I want to do? Because you have to recognize you're going to have to do work in both cases. Now, so let me, I'll, give, I'll give an example of a company that was in our last, our last cohort that I mentored. It's a, it's a fashion, it's a fashion school. And because sometimes these things are also moments, moments in time. So they have a, a nonprofit that allows them to provide training for women in, in, in Africa to be trained to, to sew and to make, uh, to make different fashionable items. Their long-term strategy is to develop, is to do two things. One, to develop their own brands that these folks could graduate from and become part of a company that actually makes this product or to become an outsourcing arm for other brands um, around sustainable fashion and again, but other things that these women, these women can build. So they create long-term employment for them. They've got a little bit of a chicken, chicken and egg. And what they've, what they've decided in the short term is build, build the nonprofit because that gives them the labor capacity they need to then go out and talk to the folks that could actually buy their goods um, that will create the revenue longer term. So in their case, they may be 80% philanthropy and 20% revenue now, but five years from now, that may, that may flip because their goal is over time that the profits generated off of the sales will feed back into the nonprofit and they won't have to be as reliant on philanthropy. So again, these are also points in, points in time, but also to Ben's point, since you can't do, and my point earlier, you, there's only so many things you can do. That understanding of that plan for them was really important because actually what it stopped them from doing, they sort of backed off the revenue side of the business for a short period of time, which seems counterintuitive to what we're trying to get them to do. But in their case, it actually made some sense in how they're trying to build their business over time. All right, so let's see, do we have any remaining, any other questions? Gower. Rob, I was thinking about um, you, you do a fair amount of impact investing at this point. And, and I was thinking about that conversation of the people that swoop in and our new ideas. Um, what's the best case for what an investor can bring to a social entrepreneur? Like, what do you hope to be as an impact investor for the social entrepreneur? Yeah, I, I tell you in the case of, of our fund, um, we're trying to do a, a, couple of, a couple of things given the resources of the fund and, and the types of companies we invest in. So some of it is absolutely what I said before is we know we're not gonna provide enough capital to get you all the way down the road. So what we're trying to do is to be that early capital, either through us or by bringing others along with us to help you get from point A to point B or point C where the business is now at a much more sustainable point where should you need larger, more institutional capital, you may be able to do it on your own. You can actually, you can actually raise it. So I think we see ourselves as kind of the the early advocates and believers in terms of capital to help you get your idea off the ground and get it to be to that next step of sustainability. The other piece certainly we also want to be is, you know, we want it, it should be more than capital, right? So we want to bring the expertise, the connections, the contacts of the people that are around our table um, because look, if we can make a phone call and introduce you to somebody that could be a client or an advisor or a key hire, it's, 
selfishly, it's in our best interest as a fund, right? As a fund, we're going to increase the opportunity of success uh, of, of, of the company. But it's also what we're trying to do, right? We're, we're genuinely trying to, to make your mission more successful. So, so again, I think it's, it's, it's a couple of things. Can our, can our capital help you get, well, both is right. Can both our capital and who we are, our expertise, uh, get you to that next phase? We're not, we're, we're not in a position where we're going to get you from, you, you know, startup to publicly traded company. But, but we got to get these are businesses. These businesses happen in steps. We want to get you to say toddler to teenager. Yeah, that's cool. Well, listen, man, we're we're uh, out of time, but obviously today you gave some some great um, wisdom. I really enjoyed um, hearing your story. Uh, I do like like the visual of of baby Rob once again being in in Brooklyn, eating a cheese pizza in front of his his father's shop. Baby Kyle in Detroit, you know, probably sitting on the hood of some Oldsmobile, and then also Baby Ben up in Lake Mary um, with his bicycle, and uh, and and us all meeting here today together, right? coming from different places. Um, and then our journeys brought us here on this call today to be able to, to, to have this experience. And so that's really cool. I really enjoy, I, I really enjoy working with you. If you can't tell already. That's mutual. That's a yeah. very mutual. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, um, Rob, once again, thank you, man, for joining this Founders Talk and uh, we enjoy having you. Always a pleasure. And you guys know how to get in touch with me. So reach out, reach out at any time. Mm -hmm.